As I said, we're going to turn our attention to Acts chapter 12. I would love if you have a copy of God's Word in front of you. That would be really, really helpful. Uh, We're going to be moving through the verses, maybe not uh, dealing with everything in this story. Um, But actually, where I want to start is at the very end. And so if you've got a copy of Acts chapter 12, uh, I want you to turn to verse 24. But the Word of God continued to spread and flourish. The Word of God continued to spread and flourish. And this is another of the if there's marking statements that Luke puts in his writings to mark the end of a section before moving on to something else. But it's a striking one, isn't it? Uh, and particularly in the context of just verse or chapter 12, it's, it's a surprising way for this chapter to end. And it's surprising because of how the chapter starts. So as we've already seen, it starts in a bad place. It, it looks like things are all going wrong. But as we've seen throughout this series, this Church on the Move series, At every stage, we can see that God is on the move through his church. He's working out his plans in his ways. And sometimes those ways seem impossible or definitely improbable to us. But they are his plans and he will work them out. And and so this chapter ends well. The word of God continued to spread and flourish. And over these weeks, we've, we've seen that, haven't we? God's word has been spreading and flourishing. That's why Luke says that it has continued to spread and flourish because God's word has already been doing so. Um, We've noticed that every week, uh, right from the church gathering in Jerusalem, then being sent from there to the regions around it. Some people making it further into Samaria and beyond, right up to last week in chapter 11, when we saw Barnabas and Saul establishing and helping to establish the church in Antioch. See, God's word had been spreading and flourishing His church was indeed on the move. And of course, we should expect that to be the case, shouldn't we? Because remember what Jesus said in Acts 1 verse 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus had promised that this is the way things were going to be. And so the word of God continued to spread and flourish. But today, what about this passage? And because of how it starts, uh, it seems that this passage would suggest that the word of God is going to slow in its spreading and its flourishing. There's something going to hit a roadblock. It's going to, uh, it's going to slow its pace. But we know how this chapter ends. The word of God spreads and flourishes. So how do we get from the, this bleak start with, with, uh, Peter, with James being killed and Peter in prison? How do we get from there to the word of God continue to spread and flourish? Well, I think what we're going to see through this, uh, through this uh, passage today is that the word of God does indeed spread and flourish. And it spreads and flourishes by at least three things. So we see it spreading and flourishing despite persecution. And we've already had a look at that. We see it spreading and flourishing fueled by prayer. And we see it spreading and flourishing as a result of God's work, God's doing. And so let's go back to the beginning of the story and see how the Word of God and the church are spreading and flourishing despite persecution. See, last week we saw in chapter 11, and particularly in the church in Antioch, um, and then we were taken at the end of that chapter to Jerusalem, and that's where we pick up again at the start of chapter 12. And we're introduced to King Herod. And it may be helpful to note that this Herod was Herod Agrippa, the the grandson of Herod the Great, who was the king when Jesus was born. Uh, And this Herod, like his predecessors, was not a nice man. Uh, to some degree, he, he was a bit of a puppet king because it was really the Romans who were in ultimate charge. But Herod still had a big sway when it came to his influence on the Jewish people. And it is clear that is, he did not like this new movement of Jesus followers. Um, and so he began to arrest some of them. He had plans to persecute them. Indeed, he had James executed. And after seeing the approval that that gained, then he planned to step things up. So he arrests Peter. And, and so Herod thinks he can crush the church. He thinks he's gaining popularity and approval and all of that fuels his activities. But inevitably, it, it's that sense of pride. It's that refusal to acknowledge God, which, which causes his ultimate downfall that we see at the end of the chapter. And so Herod maybe thinks he, he really is something. And I guess even for the church of the day who are facing life under his reign, it might have seemed that, that this was a serious threat to their existence, not to mention their growth. But ultimately, this account demonstrates that that despite what is going on, God is never out of control. God is never asleep at the wheel, 
He's working out his plans in his ways, in his timing, and so we can trust him. And, and maybe that sounds very neat and tidy and straightforward, but, but let's think about the situation that Peter and the church find themselves in. Um, the circumstances they're in do not warrant pithy little sayings or, <clears throat> or, or bumper sticker statements. The church here are in a really seriously dangerous environment. So Peter has been arrested and Herod isn't messing about. Look at the extra detail that Luke gives to show just how bleak the situation that Peter is in. After arresting him, this is verse 4, he put him in prison, that's Peter, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Peter is well and truly locked up. He's in chains and he's being well guarded. The situation looks dire. It looks like Herod is in control. Indeed, we see that he's making plans about what he intends to do. But as we see here and through the rest of the chapter, Herod's plans are no match for God's. And that's kind of the point. But before we get to that point, let's put ourselves in Peter's position. And in the position of the church in Jerusalem. You see, they don't know how the situation is going to turn out. They haven't seen the end of chapter 12 yet. And it seems that all they've known since they started gathering as a church is persecution and trial and difficulty. And now they see another one of their key leaders killed and another one locked up with his fate still to be decided. And so again, the situation looks bleak. It looks, dare we even say, it looks hopeless. But that's not the impression we get from this church. Because what we've seen so far from this group of early Christians is that whatever pressure they have faced, they haven't crumpled. In fact, throughout this series, we've seen the complete opposite. We've seen that when we would expect collapse, all we've seen is growth and strength and courage and spreading and flourishing. Remember, if you were here last week, uh, we took a look at some of the the markers that Luke has put in his writings up until this point to, to show the growth of this church, the spread of this church, the flourishing that God is bringing about. And so despite the persecution that the church is facing, It is spreading and flourishing. More and more people coming to know Jesus. The good news is advancing, just like Jesus said it would. Just like Jesus said it would. And that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Things are are happening in terms of the spreading and flourishing of the church in the way that God had said they would. Almost every week, if not every week, we've recognised God's mighty hand at work in the situations that these first Christians find themselves in. Right from Stephen's heroic and and gracious martyrdom through the guidance of Philip to the chariot side of the Ethiopian. Then Saul's epic encounter with the risen Lord Jesus himself. And then the the angel involvement and the heavenly visions in Cornelius' appointment with Peter. Uh, Then the placing of specific people in specific places for the church in Antioch to begin and grow. All along we can trace the hand of God at work. And sometimes that's in dramatic and, and clear ways. And in other times it seems to be more behind the scenes and and it's only with hindsight that we can fully appreciate God's hand at work. But all along, at every step, God has been at work. And so now we have this scene in Jerusalem where this king with a small K has plans to to squash the community of the king with a capital K. And there's only going to be one winner. And so even though the situation looks bleak, maybe even from some perspectives looks hopeless, it's clear from what we read that Peter and the early church do not think so. The experiences they had had up to this point would have fueled the fire of faith in their hearts. They had seen God's work in in wondrous and miraculous ways in the days and weeks that preceded this arrest. So why would they not expect God's plan to be worked out in the middle of another difficult situation, even if at the time they couldn't see it for themselves? And perhaps it was this kind of faith, this uh, level of hope, this trust in the God they knew, which meant that the church was able to spread and flourish despite persecution. Perhaps it was the complete confidence that they worshipped the true and living God. And so even though hardship and persecution and death may come, they still knew that faithfulness to him was the right path to take. In fact, the only path to take. And so they spread the good news of Jesus. The church continued to flourish despite the persecution they faced. So that's the first thing we see in these chapters, that despite the persecution, the word of God continued to spread and flourish. 
The second thing that I want to note is that we see the church continuing to spread and flourish and it was fueled by prayer. And so what I want to do now is recognize the amazing response of this church to the crisis they seem to be facing. And so as we've already noted, their attitude was not to see this as bleak and hopeless, but rather look at what we see in verse five. Rather they gather. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Uh, and this might sound like a, like a simple sentence, but it's a remarkable response given what we've seen in the first four verses. The church are in a great time of need and their immediate response is to pray. And this isn't some kind of knee-jerk reaction. And in fact, it's a pattern that we've seen time and time again by the early believers. I mean, if we look back into Acts 1, we see them praying after the ascension of Jesus. In Acts 2, where 3,000 are gathered and the, the church in Jerusalem is born, then we see the pattern of prayer as a regular part of their meeting together. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John hold in front of the ruling council of Sanhedrin. And what's the response? Again, the church gather to pray. In fact, Peter and John are told, stop talking about Jesus. And so the, the church gathered to pray for greater boldness. See, prayer was a, was a vital aspect of the life of this church. And, and I mean vital in the sense of complete dependence. Prayer was, was not just an activity that this church did. But, but the impression from the text is that this prayer was like the lifeblood of the church. It, it was the engine room from which everything else flowed. And it's not hard to see the connection for us today, that as we long to see God's church continue to spread and flourish, that we should be people of prayer. Not just in those gathered and planned meetings, which are of course good and right and we would love to see you on Wednesday, but in both of those formal and informal ways, we should be people of prayer. With one another, gathering digitally and physically when we can, we should be praying people. And I know that can be difficult. I, I know that attitude can be difficult to foster in, our, in ourselves as individuals, not to mention corporately. But let's spur one another on to, with greater energy to that end that we would be praying people. And so let's not let it be weird to pray at the end of a phone call with one another. Let, let's not let it feel odd to ask one another for prayer for specific situations we're facing. Let's not let prayer just be a nice way to conclude our time together. But actually, let's allow prayer to become so ingrained that in everything that we do that it becomes unnatural not to pray together. And so, so this early group of believers were a praying church. But even in that, I, I love the reality that we see in these verses too. You see, they were a praying people. Yes, they were a believing people, absolutely. But I love that they are still surprised when they see their prayers answered. And so when Peter realizes that he's out of prison, which is an interesting one in and of itself, when Peter realizes, we're told in verse 11, he came to himself. But then once he does that, he goes to Mary's house. And we read in verse 12, that when this had dawned on him, this is talking about Peter. And what's the this that had dawned on him? The this that had dawned was the fact that he was in prison uh, shackled to, with soldiers on either side and now he finds himself standing in an empty street when this had dawned on him he went to the house of mary the mother of john also called mark where many people had gathered and were praying peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named rhoda came to answer the door when she recognized peter's voice she was overjoyed so overjoyed she ran back without opening it and exclaimed peter is at the door you're out of your mind they told her when she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. You, you can picture the scene, can't you? It, it's almost comical if the stakes weren't so high. But Peter's left standing, knocking at the door, even though the group inside have been praying for him. And even though they've been praying for him, they, they still can't quite believe that it might actually be him at the door. Now, rather than thinking that, that this group must have lacked faith or, or must not have trusted God enough for this to be true. I think what this actually shows is how wonderful and gracious God is when it comes to our prayers. You see, we might think we're praying big and impossible prayers almost, but we must remember that we worship and serve and, and pray to a God who can do immeasurably more than we can even ask or imagine. And so when it comes to this group, we're not told what exactly they've been praying for. Maybe they've been praying for Peter's safety. Maybe they've been praying for a fair trial. Maybe they've been praying for his deliverance. But in all of that, they didn't expect him to turn up at the door. 
And so what we see is, is God hearing their prayer and answering it, but, but not just answering it. He's also demonstrating his complete power and authority and answering their prayers in a way that they could have never expected. And, and as readers for, of, of this encounter nearly 2,000 years later, we should take note of that reality. As Jack just mentioned with the kids, God answers prayer. Sometimes that happens in ways that we might expect or ways that we can even understand or see. Other times, we would never have anticipated God answering that prayer in that way. But let's remember that God is bigger than our biggest prayer. And so let's be bolder in our prayers for others. Let's be bolder in our prayers for our community. Let's be bolder in our prayers for God's church. Let's be bolder in our prayers for ourselves because he is bigger than our biggest prayer. Now, before we move on, we have to realize that one of the ways in which God sometimes unexpectedly answers our prayer is by not providing what we've been praying for. And that can be when especially even in those times when we're asking for things that we think would be in line with what God would want. But yet those prayers seem to go unanswered. Why is that? Now, now that's a massive question. We've mentioned it before. Undoubtedly, we will mention it again. And so I'm sorry that this might feel like some kind of surface skimming answer. But in the same way that, that we pray to a God who can do things beyond our understanding or comprehension, that also means that he has the benefit of, of seeing time and circumstances in ways that we cannot begin to fathom. And so sometimes that means that the, the answer to our prayer is not yet. So sometimes that means the answer to our prayer is no. But in every and any situation, our, our privilege is to trust him. And sometimes that's a challenging privilege, but it's still such a privilege. We trust in this sovereign, mighty, bigger God than our big prayers kind of God. He is our good father. He will give us what he knows is best when he knows it's best to give. And sometimes that means a not yet. Sometimes that means a no. And I, and I realize that even in saying those last couple of minutes, it doesn't come in any way close to dealing with some of the pain and frustration that many of us encounter as we think of these things or people or circumstances that we've been praying for, maybe even for years. I'm not minimizing the reality of that. But as we see in this passage, God hears our prayer and he often answers those prayers in ways we can't predict, in ways we can't fully appreciate. And so we trust that he's still in control despite how things might look. As Jack said again, he is the God, he is in control. He is working out his plan and he will, in this context, he will continue to build his church. He will continue to make his name known. And, and so we obey and we wait and we continue to pray. And in doing so, the church continues to spread and flourish through his people who trust him and who pray fervently, earnestly to him. And so we've seen that the spreading and the flourishing of the church comes despite persecution. It comes fueled by prayer. And the final and brief point I want to bring to our attention is something that we've talked about already. That the church spreads and flourishes. That the word of God spread and flourishes as a result of his doing. As a result of God's doing. And we have mentioned this already this morning. In fact, it, it sort of feels like it's been the thread that's ran through our whole series that in these verses, one thing that the encounter of Peter and the jail shows is that there, is, there could be no doubt of who was behind the spreading and flourishing of God's church. What was being experienced was happening at the Lord's hand. Just look at how Peter even explains this to himself and then again to others. So in verse 11, we see Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent an angel and rescued. It was the Lord. In verse 17, we see as Peter standing at the door, he motions for the, uh, the crowd who have now gathered, who are now astonished, we see at the end of verse 16, Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. See, Peter knew that, that this miraculous escape, it had nothing to do with him. Remember back at the start of the chapter, we find him sleeping in his cell. This was not some kind of Shawshank Redemption style mastermind plan of, of prison break. He had nothing to do with it. 
This was nothing to do with Peter and his ability and his cleverness and his outwitting of the guards. No, Peter had nothing to do with it. This was God's work. Uh, and this account of Peter would, it would have helped the group who were praying to anticipate that the way that things were lo- working out was so far beyond the confines of human effort that it was unquestionable that God was at work. God was building his church. God was on the move through his church. God was spreading his word. God was flourishing his word. And so they could take great courage, great faith. And surely that fueled the spreading and flourishing as they went on from this place to continue the spread and flourishing of God's word. And so we see the spreading and the flourishing of God in this wonderful verse in chapter, in verse 24. But the word of God continue to spread and flourish. Ten words that sound so simple but are actually incredibly profound. Uh, And one of the ways they're so profound for us is is to recognise that that God is continuing that work. God is continuing to spread and flourish. His word continues to spread and flourish. That's his plan. Uh, And so that will be what happens. Uh, And I suppose one of the most searching questions that we need to ask ourselves is are we spending our life working towards that aim also? Or are we getting distracted by lots of other things and and therefore missing out on the joy and the freedom of experiencing God at work in the ways that we see described in these chapters and Acts? See, one of the the lessons from the potentially bizarre scenario of verses 19 to 23, which records Herod's demise, one of the lessons from that is the stark reality of what it means to try to oppose God's plans or at least to be so preoccupied with our own plans that we put our plans in place of God's. Now, obviously, there's a lot more detail that we could go in here now, but what it, for now, what I think Luke is trying to show is, is that God is achieving his purposes. And anyone who seeks to stand in the way or anyone who seeks to thwart God's plans is on the wrong side. Remember back to the beginning of the chapter, Herod has been trying to arrest members of the church, persecute them. But as we've seen week after week in this series, God's business was in building his church. So it didn't matter who you were or how lofty your position on earth seemed. If you were not on God's side, then you were on the losing side. That's the stark reality that Herod Herod learned. God's will would be done, no matter how much he tried to stand against it. And Maybe we feel like, like we're not comparable with Herod. Um, that, that he was a really bad egg and, and so God's dealings with him don't have much to teach me. But, but can I graciously say, let, let's not be fooled into missing the, the stark reminder of God's righteous holiness, his, his just dealing with sin. Rather, let us see this warning that's in front of us, not to waste our lives chasing after priorities that are not God's priorities. And what are God's priorities? Well, we've seen them in terms of this whole series. It's clear his priorities are around his word spreading and flourishing, his good news being spread, his church being built, and that church being on the move with the message of Jesus to a world that needs to hear it. And so his word will spread and flourish. It has been doing so for 2,000 years and it will continue to do so. And it will spread and flourish despite the persecution that we may face. So therefore we can be courageous. It will spread and flourish, fueled by prayer, so let's be praying, people. It will spread and flourish as a result of God's doing, so let's be attentive to where he is leading us to go. And all of that is so that the good news will spread and flourish, that we will continue to be witnesses of his to the ends of the earth, in Gilnahirk, and Braniel, Dundonald, and Shandon, and Kings Road, and Tully Carnet, and Cherry Valley, and Ballygown, and, and beyond. Let's be his church on the move as we seek to faithfully spread his message of good news. And remember, his message is good news. The message of Jesus is good news. When we realise that, 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 that the sin in our lives is keeping us separated, eternally separated from our Father God, yet in his majestic love, he stepped in to provide the sacrifice for us, to, to, to pay the penalty in our place that Jesus Christ came into the world, living the perfect life, demonstrating what it means to, for the kingdom of God to be in our midst. And then he took the penalty that was mine and yours, the penalty of my sin, and he hung on the cross, taking that upon himself. 
so that when I put my faith and my trust in him and in him alone, then I am welcomed in with the arms of an embracing Heavenly Father. That my sin has now been dealt with. In this wonderful exchange, the righteousness of Jesus is put on me and my, the filth of my sin is put on him. This is grace, this is mercy, this is love. And then, of course, rising from the dead, Jesus shows that he is more powerful than the sin that he, that he died to pay for. He is more powerful than his enemy. He is, he is more powerful than anything. And so he reigns eternal, waiting to come again and usher in his kingdom in all its fullness. And, and so maybe this morning we, we need to appreciate that this is God's good news. This is what he's calling us to share. And yes, there can be times when it feels like we are under pressure, it feels like we are facing some kind of, um, of persecution, and I use that word, uh, aware of how the global state of persecution looks. But we know that the word of God continues to spread despite persecution, so we can be courageous. We know that the word of God continues to spread and flourish, fueled by prayer, so let's get on our knees with one another, for one another. And God's word will continue to spread and flourish as a result of his doing. It's his grace at work in my life that means I can then serve him. It's not I serve him to earn his grace, I serve him to grow his kingdom. No, this is God's doing. And it's all as a result of his wonderful love and grace. And so we, we come again to, as we do every week, to, to remember the joy of the good news of Jesus. And we do that by taking communion together. Uh, and I think that's an incredibly fitting way to do it, to finish off this series as we think of the church on the move, then we recognize that we are the church of God because of what Jesus has done for us. And so let's prepare ourselves for communion. Uh, and one of the ways I want to do that, that, the Bible is clear that we examine our hearts before we, we take of the elements. And so I, I want to give us space and time to do that. Uh, one of the things we're going to do is sing together. We're going to sing, Oh, praise the name. This glorious uh, declaration that Jesus is worthy of praise because of what he's done. And, and the song walks us wonderfully through uh, the, the, the story and the weekend of, of Calvary and the resurrection and the coming, uh, coming kingdom that is to be. And so let's sing that song together. And maybe you want to gather the elements where you are, maybe so, some bread, uh, uh, so, uh, some juice, some wine, however you celebrate that together. Um, and so let's prepare ourselves for communion. But before we do that, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you even for this morning. Uh, this, this reminder once again uh, that your word spreads and flourishes. Thank you, Father, that your word has spread and flourished uh, from the, the, the eastern coast of the Mediterranean 2,000 years ago to here uh, and into my life and in the lives of many of those who are watching. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful good news of your salvation, your forgiveness of sins, your rescue from an eternity without you. Thank you, Father, that you have drawn us into relationship with you. And so, God, we praise you. And in response to that wonderful grace and mercy that has been shown, we pray that you would strengthen us to continue your mission that you've given us to do. Help us, Father, to, uh, to be people who, who love and care for one another and spur one another on to that end and pray for one another regularly and with one another when we can. And we thank you, Father, that, that we are entering into your mission Thank you that you are on the move and you will continue to be on the move. And so we want to join you in your mission and with all the energy and all the freedom that you, that you give and that we can muster. Father, come, we pray. And, and as we turn our attention towards celebrating communion together, we're, we're just reminded, Father, of the wonderful sacrifice that you paid to draw us into this relationship with you so that we would know forgiveness of sin, so that we would know life with you for, for now and for all eternity. And so we pray, even as we sing, that you would, you would enlighten our hearts again to the wonder of the sacrifice that you paid on our behalf. And may you indeed receive the praise that's due your name because of your good news. And so it is for your glory, for your kingdom, for the extension of that kingdom, for the growth of your church, for the continued spread and flourishing of your word that we pray. Amen. Amen.